What's up YouTube, Brian here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode I'm always contending for the faith, once for all, delivered to the saints. And today, we're going to solve the problem of Genesis. Stick around. <laughs> Right, so that was incredibly deceitful. <laughs> We're not going to solve anything. As a matter of fact, we are the problem uh, of Genesis, but the problem of Genesis has been solved for us. And so, no, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I hope this wasn't clickbait. This isn't going to be a creation evolution debate at all. Uh, this is going to simply be uh, dealing with Genesis and its answer as history. Uh, and addressing uh, this in theological conversation, I, am, I happen to be really good at the creation and evolution debate, uh, but I don't like it. I, I don't see it as being uh, salvific. And uh, if anyone tries to engage me in that creation evolution debate, my uh, go-to is we'll talk about that. But I'd rather you try to convince me that Jesus didn't rise from the dead because that is the core of my faith. Just go for the throat and get it over with. But if Jesus is truly risen from the dead, then everything he said as someone who predicted that death and resurrection before it, everything he said before it is true. And Jesus believed Genesis is history. So what is the problem of Genesis? The problem of Genesis is the succumbing uh, to temptation that there were rules laid out for Adam and Eve and they knew those rules and they disobeyed. And that inherently, boom, dead, that you will die. And that is passed to you and to me. And now there's this modern concept um, when it comes to how we view body and soul. Um, we kind of, oh God, I've heard this so many times uh, growing up as a kid. Oh, that's not really so-and-so. That's just their body. That's just the vessel. So-and-so is in heaven. Look, the Bible doesn't talk to us in that kind of a language. The Bible sees us holistically, body and soul, one unit. We are body and soul. So, biblically, if the soul dies while we are alive in our flesh, even in our flesh, we are dead on our feet. We are, we are dead. So um, this is why uh, the Bible would say, you who were dead in your trespasses and sins. So, well, but we're, we're, not, we're not dead, you moron. We're walking around. We're alive. We have a will. No, you're dead in your trespasses and sins. So even though you're, 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 you're a dead man walking, that's how the Bible sees us. Body and soul, a single unit. So the problem of, of Genesis, the problem of the Garden of Eden, is the fall into sin. And so we're going to look at how that went down, and then we're going to see what God has done in his infinite mercy to restore that to us. So we're going to go to Genesis. Uh, and we're going to start uh, in chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge, of good and evil, you shall not eat. For the day that you eat it, you surely will die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now, what are the, yeah, And then we, you know, so bringing the animals, Adam naming them. Um, God knew that wasn't going to work. Uh, he just did it um, to show Adam, you need what Adam says, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This is, this is woman. Uh, so therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Genesis chapter 3. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. 
But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, of the Lord God walking amongst the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and on dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain shall you bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins, and clothed them. Whew! So... God said, don't eat from this tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat from it. On the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Now, God is not a liar. So we know that on that day that Adam and Eve ate from the fruit, they died. Spiritual death. Again, the the Bible doesn't speak of body and soul as two separate things. It is one person, and so that death is the rending apart of one person. Now, we're all going to be raised from the dead on the last day, body and soul reunited, but are we going to be raised to eternal life, or are we going to be raised for eternal death? Um, (laughs) uh, My my eight-year-old, soon to be nine-year-old, was sitting here on the couch. He has this little, well, I say little, beginner's Bible. He likes to read from it sometimes uh, because it's a big book and he can just keep reading. And all of a sudden I'll be like, hey, 20 minutes is up. Your signed reading is done. Um, Go play. And uh, he was reading it and uh, he looked up at me and he asked me out of the blue, he goes, Daddy, what's wrong with knowing the difference between good and evil? Aha, you're in Genesis, aren't you, buddy? Okay, fair question. Look, there's nothing wrong with knowing the difference between good and evil. What was wrong when Adam and Eve did it is they decided that they themselves would be the judge of what is good and evil, not God. God told them what was good and told them what was evil. And rather than faith trusting in God that this is true, they decided to be the judge for themselves. And all of a sudden, what happened? They decided nakedness. <laughs> uh, the way God made, there's something wrong with the way God made me. I must cover this. And what's wrong with us deciding for ourselves the knowledge of good and evil? When they heard the Lord walking in the cool of the day, they hid for fear. We've disobeyed. We've, they've, they died. And the problem that God solves uh, is how Eve was tempted. The serpent misquoted scripture to her. And Eve misquoted scripture back. And then, pff, done. It was just done. 
<laughs> Satan through the serpent lied <laughs> and he got told back a lie and it was done. Uh, <laughs> So, as uh, the Apostle Paul would say, in Adam, all die. But there is a second Adam. And so, during this uh, season of Lent, we're going to turn to the Gospel of Matthew, and we're going to find an interesting uh, parallel to the temptation in the garden. So, we are in Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him again, It is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Now it's interesting with Jesus that the devil didn't misquote scripture, but the devil coming to God in human flesh, knowing he is talking to the eternal God, to the creator of the universe, but bound in human flesh. The infinite confining itself to the finite. Satan comes to tempt the finite. And Jesus, 40 days and nights without food, was hungry. Man, I can't go a day. <laughs> and he's weak and tired. Hired, and Satan is just there rightly quoting scripture to him. Well, I mean, you're God. Command the stones to become bread. And Jesus answers back with the correct scripture reference. So Satan again takes him up. Hey, throw yourself off this building because <laughs> Jesus, as you just said, it is written. See, See, Satan's not lying to Jesus because Jesus quoted back and Satan's not stupid. It is written, Jesus. Jesus says, it is also written, do not tempt the Lord your God. So this is twofold. This is Jesus saying to Satan, don't tempt me, I'm God. And this is Jesus in human flesh as the son of God saying, I'm not going to tempt my father. Or don't put the Lord your God to the test. So this is Jesus saying to Satan, don't test me. At the same time, it's Jesus saying, I'm not testing my father. And then bow down and worship me. Nope. You shall worship God alone. Be gone, Satan. <laughs> so uh, by the one man, the many were made sinners. By one man, many shall be made righteous. This is the answer to the problem of Genesis. And of course, the answer, as it always is in Sunday school, is Jesus. So during this time of Lent, these 40 days where we may or may not be fasting, we can think about Jesus' Lent for us. And that is what this Lent is all about. Our Lent, our giving up of something if we so choose, our season of repentance, our meditating on God's word, beginning with this reading out of Matthew for the first Sunday in Lent, Jesus' Lent is our Lent. So our Lent is just Christian devotion. It merits us nothing. It achieves us nothing. It it earns us nothing. It's just good Christian practice. But Jesus' Lent for us, in his Lent, there is power. He has undone the curse 
of the Garden of Eden. He has withstood in human flesh the temptation of Satan. The second Adam has done what the first Adam could not. So in Adam all die, in Christ all live. And so thank God Almighty for Jesus' Lent for you, where he did what you could not. And throughout these 40 days of Lent, as we focus on our Savior going to the cross, we look at his perfect obedience, both active and passive, and we see it nailed to the cross and condemned in our place. That perfect, sinless Son of God, nailed to a cross, condemned in our place, and freely giving his righteousness that he earned by his perfect life and death. If that He gives that to us as righteousness. Until next time, may God richly bless you and the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.